Welcome everybody to Ultrasound Grand Rounds uh, this week. Pretty excited uh, to continue on our series over the course of this, this fall semester. We've been had, having a lot of great topics about critical care and cardiac ultrasound and all sorts of good stuff like that. Uh, but today I'm really excited to have a special guest, but I have I wanted to ask uh, Ziad to do the special introductions because a good friend of his uh, who's going to be presenting for us today. So Z, go ahead and take it away, introduce our special guest, and uh, we'll uh, learn some really good stuff today. Okay, thanks, Matt. And I'm Ziad Shaman, one of the polymer critical care docs at Metro Health. And I have the pleasure of introducing Stephanie Cha. Dr. Cha is a cardiothoracic anesthesia at Johns Hopkins uh, uh, Hospital, and she's also she also staffs the ICU over there in addition to being an anesthesiologist. Mm -hmm. And I met Stephanie uh, several years ago at the ATS where she gave this excellent lecture on using point of care ultrasound in, uh, cardi in cardiac resuscitation during an arrest. So I heard the lecture, I always wanted to hear it again. So thanks for joining us and thanks for uh, being able to present. No problem at all. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I mean, I think Ziad is very humble. We teach together. He always teaches the hardest topics and makes them seem very interesting. And when he told me about this series, I was um, really looking forward to being part of it. So let me um, share my screen here. All right. Okay. Um, so I'm sure that lots of the listeners here no longer feel terror when they see a vital screen that looks something like this. Um, this comes from one of our simulation scenarios that we do with our own residents and trainees um, in which we teach how to use POCUS during arrest scenarios. Um, and so I first gave this talk at ATS, um, which I think is a great course. Um, and I found it very useful to continue on um, when educating our own trainees. Um, in their own longitudinal curriculum. So let's get started. Um, I don't have any relevant disclosures. Um, just to review, we know that in hospital cardiac arrest um, is still very challenging to manage. Um, and there's a great difference between patients who present with shockable rhythms and those who present in asystole or PEA, as you can see here. Um, and while survival is improving, it's still overall poor. So you can see that only a little under 25% um, of folks presenting with this survived the hospital discharge. Um, there are a number of advances that have been made to help take better care of these patients. And we can see they span the pre-arrest, peri-arrest, and post-arrest phases. Um, and where ultrasound can be really useful, I've tried to underline here, um, are some of these topics like identifying reversible causes for arrests and also helping to guide um, hemodynamic management in the post-arrest phase of care as well. Just an aside, um, I always tell all of our trainees, you know, if you are seeing a shockable rhythm, so the FVT, do not delay defibrillation. We're not even really thinking about ultrasound at this point. And this came from that kind of landmark New England Journal study, which showed that you know, earlier defibrillation um, resulted in much better outcomes, specifically around the two-minute mark. And so when we think about using ultrasound for arrest, and many of you may already be using this in your own practice, we think about how we can use it to not only identify those reversible etiologies of arrests, but also to provide some prognostic information. So we'll talk about the difference between true versus pseudo-PEA and why that's important um, to distinguish in a patient but in addition, as we'll see, um, identifying certain fatal pathologies right away can be very helpful as well. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about how ultrasound can be very sensitive for detecting arrhythmia, specifically fine VF, which we might not otherwise recognize immediately from our vital screens. Um, and a little bit, this has a little more to do with TEE, how ultrasound can be used to also assess compression quality. Um, in addition to guiding peri-arrest or post-arrest procedural guidance that might be indicated. So there's never any shame in pulling out the H's and T's, you know, just pull out your card. I tell all of our residents, you know, these are on the code cards. If they're not in your pockets, just review them with your team, run through these diagnoses out loud, and we'll see how some of these can become very evident, or we can feel a lot more confident that these conditions are present um, with ultrasound. So 
this bar graph came from an earlier study which looked at patients presenting to the ED and PEA. Um, you're going to see there's actually the majority of these patients fitted, um, fit this profile of pseudo PEA, which I'll explain a little more later. Um, but that a couple points of note were that certain diagnoses like LV dysfunction, acute LV dysfunction and tamponade um, still continue to be under-recognized. And of course, in my world, in the cardiac surgery world, um, almost these are, these are really big buckets that we need to rule out almost immediately. Um, this chart um, came from a similar study of ED patients, and you can just see when ultrasound was used versus when it was not. Of course, overall, there was a decline in survival to hospital discharge um, from ROSC, but with um, identifiable causes for arrest um, identified through ultrasound, there was a signal of improved survival. And what's important is also in this small series, you know, all images obtained were considered diagnostic quality. And what's interesting is that the um, most prevalent reversible etiology so um, that was seen was cardiac tamponade. Um, here are a couple still um, images which just show, they're also costal views, so one of the best views um, uh, when you're evaluating patients in arrest, but we can see a variety of diagnoses that um, really need to be ruled out almost immediately. And we can see on the upper left, very hyperdynamic chambers that, you know, could be present in very low SVR states, but what we would really want to rule out is hypovolemia, bleeding, um, ideologies such as these. On the upper right, we see a really large, almost unrecognizable RV. So here's a QRV dysfunction. And of course, we want to rule out both acute RV or LV dysfunction. And on the bottom, um, we can see a pericardial collection, you know, between the liver and the right ventricle. And although it is not large, um, we do already see some evidence of right ventricular impairment or um, impairment of venous return, um, indicating tamponade if that were to correlate clinically. Just a note on tamponade, um, even a small effusion um, can cause tamponade physiology. Both pleural and pericardial effusions can cause it, and I've seen both cases, um, but it is important to differentiate what is the cause um, because that would really guide your management. And that not surprisingly, early identification that leads to early treatment is associated with improved survival. So you can see this one study citing 15 versus 1%. PE, this is something that comes up all the time when I respond to codes on the floor. Um, these patients who are arresting, you know, what can be very helpful um, is directly visualizing clot in transit, but that is not always something that, you know, we do see. What we probably see more often is an acutely dilated RV in someone with risk factors. And in fact, PE is often cited as one of the most common etiologies of non-traumatic PEA arrest. Um, and ultrasound can be helpful both in making that diagnosis, you know, guiding appropriate therapy like thrombolytics, who would be responsive to it, but also who might um, be a good candidate for eCPR. Um, and I can say, you know, in the past month, we've actually put two patients on um, ECMO as a bridge to resolution of PE um, following arrest on the floor. So when it comes to prognostication, we talked about this a little bit, um, but we are going to talk a little more about the meaning of identifying cardiac standstill, um, which would really differentiate something called true PEA versus pseudo PEA. In addition, there are certain pathologies that are very high risk, um, you know, identification of acute aortic dissection, for instance, um, that would certainly change how we think about these patient outcomes. Um, but before we go into any of that, I just want to take a step back and um, reinforce that pulse detection is really hard. It is the you know first step in all of our ACLS and BLS scenarios, but um, it's not easy even for people who are trained to do it. So these were some really early studies that um, I think are probably still replicable in which we see that even ICU ED doctors and nurses um, a good proportion of them cannot detect a carotid pulse within five seconds of a healthy volunteer, or um, even when someone's systolic blood pressure is over 80. Um, and it's nothing to be ashamed of. This is an interesting study that don't ask me who designed this. It's a very interesting randomized trial in which um, volunteers were brought into a room in which the presence of a cardiopulmonary bypass machine was somehow blinded from them. So probably some very elaborate curtain scenario. Um, but what I wanted to highlight with these asterisks was 
when patients were actually pulseless on cardiopulmonary bypass, those um, volunteers still detected a pulse, you know, not a small percentage of the time. And similarly, when those patients were not on cardiopulmonary bypass, a good proportion of those volunteers could not detect a pulse. Um, so again, it's just something that is really hard to do. And this is why ultrasound can be very useful to us. Um, and how it's useful is really differentiating these two conditions. So true PEA versus pseudo PEA. Um, true PEA is what we think about when we think of true electrical mechanical dissociation. So we have an organized electrical rhythm, um, but no pulse and also no evidence of spontaneous cardiac motion on ultrasound. Um, and it's a little bit grainy quality on the left-hand side, but I hope you can appreciate that its heart is really not moving compared to the clip on the right side, which we call pseudo PEA, in which again, there's electrical activity, although we don't have detection of pulse, but on ultrasound, we do sense spontaneous cardiac motion. So there is cardiac activity here. And that is meaningful because those patients with pseudo PEA uh, both um, occur more frequently um, than we probably would expect and have better hemodynamic profiles. So when we measure their central pressures, gas exchange, response to epinephrine, all of that is more favorable in this patient population. Um, this was a flow chart that looked at uh, almost 50 ICU patients. And you can see in those with pseudo PEA, um, their profile demonstrated much better um, uh, survival to ROSC and overall survival compared to the group that had true PEA, which in this series at least had 0% survival to hospital discharge. So again, pseudo PEA is much more common probably than true PEA and those patients with it um, have much more favorable outcomes. So on the flip side, what does true PEA or cardiac standstill look like? Here's a clip that you know always takes a minute to sort of adjust your eyes to because not only do we have no cardiac motion here on this four chamber view, but we also see some organization of clot or thrombus in those ventricles as well. Um, this is a meta-analysis which just kind of confirms that there's a very low risk, um, there's a very low incidence of ROSC when we see the absence of cardiac contractility, although it is not zero. Um, and on the you know, other side of the coin, pseudo PEA um, is much more favorable. And here we see a forest plot that is very right shifted, um, in which case pseudo PEA being a marker that predicts ROSC. Um, so let's change gears a little bit and talk about how we can use ultrasound to assess the quality of compressions with ongoing CPR. You know, the assumption is that CPR over the chest center, if you think about where the old pads are being placed, um, and where you're applying your compressions, um, you know, may not be over the RV assisting forward flow all of the time. And in fact, there are some studies which cite that the physical location of where we perform CPR may actually be over the LV outflow tract or aortic root or ascending aorta obstructing flow in a not small percentage of patients. Um, and while TTE may help us um, guide optimal placement of compressions. Really TEE is probably more useful for this. And after this, I'd be interested to hear if any of you are using our TEE during your codes. Um, but TEE can provide actually continuous visualization of cardiac structures, including the RV, um, and help guide us to know that we're performing CPR at the right place in the right time. In addition, continuous ultrasound imaging with um, either TTE or TEE can help with the early identification of fine VF, which may look for all the rest of the world like asystole on our EKG screens. This illustration just showed how, you know, the compressions that we think are normally occurring over the center of the chest can actually, you can see by these asterisks, um, be positioned at quite different locations over the cardiac chambers, um, some of which may actually obstruct forward flow. So um, I wasn't going to talk too much about TEE, although I use it a lot and I have been calling for it more and more during our in-hospital codes. But um, some of the advantages are that it can overcome some of the imaging limitations of TTE. So certainly um, the resolution of the images is usually superior um, in patients who have obstructions to good TTE views, you know, hyperinflated lungs or surgical wound dressings. Um, you know, TE usually provides better quality imaging. Um, with more structures visualized. Um, 
We also know that it probably leads to shorter CPR interruptions. So when you look at no flow periods, um, when ACLS is ongoing, TEE um, versus TTE, you can see nine versus 19 seconds here. Um, but on you know the other side of the coin, TEE is invasive and it does require specialty training to perform. Um, this was an illustration that just showed, you know, one choreograph choreography um, recommendation for using TEE um, during codes. You can see the sonographer here um, up at the head of the bed, compressors around the patients, still requiring lots of team members and coordination among them um, to not compromise ongoing CPR. So now I wanted to shift a little bit and talk about um, ultrasound solutions to the challenges of ALS and specifically how we can incorporate POCUS in, in for the most part, this refers to TTE or cardiac imaging um, or surface imaging um, to identify some of those reversible etiologies of arrest in an ALS compliant way, meaning in a way that does not compromise good quality CPR, which includes um, minimal disruptions to CPR. Um, and I just want to remind you part of this, you know, even before kind of entering the imaging cycle is to first identify the presence of spontaneous cardiac motion and which patients have true PEA versus pseudo PEA. What does everyone else say about using ultrasound in arrest scenarios? I mean, I think that this is becoming much more popular and uh, utilized, but a lot of these guidelines really haven't been updated and we can see um, the kind of range in their, the strength of their recommendations. So the AHA in 2015 said ultrasound may be used to identify some of those reversible etiologies with the reservation that it was unclear whether it affected clinical outcomes. Um, the European Resuscitation Council probably had the strongest language in that it um, described there was no doubt that ultrasound had potential to identify these etiologies, but that um, specific protocols should be used when using ultrasound and that cardiac standstill, as we mentioned, um, is very highly predictive of death. Um, SCCM also recommended the use of ultrasound um, in these arrest patients. And in 2014, the ASE, probably sort of like the Vegas, Vegas language available, um, just commented that ultrasound might be superior to physical exam in some of these causes um, and that there was potential for it to change management. Um, so let's talk about the execution of using ultrasound in ALS. Um, and if you think about your kind of continuous CPR cycle, there is an opportunity, um, usually during these pulse rhythm checks, um, in which we do intentionally disrupt CPR when where ultrasound may be able to be used. And we really have to weigh the risk benefit of it in these scenarios. The, the risk, of course, being further disruption to CPR, the benefit, um, of course, being very early identification of what the cause of arrest is. So how long should these no-flow intervals be? Um, well, in the adult protocols, it really just says that we should keep these as brief as possible. And this is based on literature we know that defibrillation attempts are less successful when the pauses are longer, the, um, both the coronary blood flow and neurologic exams, um, animal models are worse if CPR is interrupted for rescue breathing versus CPR alone. So again, sort of suggesting that just straight continuous CPR is superior um, and that improved survival seen with continuous CPR and out of hospital cardiac arrest patients, um, further supporting just zero to no disruptions. Um, and it's really only PALS without a lot of evidence behind it that um, suggests specifically that we keep these pauses to less than 10 seconds. And that's kind of where most of these um, algorithms that support use of ultrasound, um, you know, how that um, time restriction has been born. So that 10 second kind of holy grail is um, really not based on a whole lot. Um, how do we actually do clinically? So um, this was a study that came out of an ED and it did show that, you know, when using POCUS, um, there was an increase in the um, CPR pause. So 21 seconds versus 13 seconds. So no ultrasound was used. 
um, there was a lot of variability in how the ultrasound was being applied and um, what protocol was being used if there was any. Um, but there were some modifying factors. And one of the most important ones was, of course, that the person performing the ultrasound was someone who was trained to do so. But probably the biggest factor was actually that the um, code leader and the sonographer, so to say, um, were separated, meaning were different people. So there were lots of times when the code team leader was also performing the ultrasound, and that led to um, a really long increase in those pauses. Um, many of you may have heard of the feel focused echocardiographic evaluation and life support um, protocol, also um, which goes hands in hands with the FEAR protocol. Um, and this is one of the earliest and probably best described protocols for using POCUS in um, PEA arrest. And what you see by these black bars, this is really a timeline here spanning across the slide. These black bars indicate those no flow intervals or CPR disruptions when. Um, ultrasound was being performed. And at least when it was being in, was being taught to providers, um, there was not a significant difference in the percentage of time spent off the chest during these code scenarios. Um, we taught it also to our residents and fellows. We do this every year um, in a boot camp, And we found that when we led these trainees through successive scenarios, so one through five, um, both their no flow interval, so the absolute time of off the chest, as well as the number of no flow intervals less than 10 seconds, so compliant with the you know algorithm improved. So it just sort of suggests that, you know, although of course our human tendency is to prolong these intervals in order to use ultrasound, we can be trained um, with specific algorithms to be more compliant and really minimize those disruptions as much as possible. Um, and here were some um, suggested mechanisms for minimizing those CPR pauses. And most of this is repetitive, but does state that, you know, at least two physicians should be present or two providers should be present so that we can split the roles between sonographer and co-team leader. Um, the person with the most ultrasound experience should probably be the sonographer. And that when scanning under a protocol, these interventions um, can help to minimize that time off the chest, which include preparing the ultrasound before the no-flow interval, having a team member, usually the co-team leader, count down those 10 seconds out loud, and recording the scan as it's being obtained so that there isn't so much burden to make the diagnosis on the spot in real time, but that the scan can then be reviewed um, later after resumption of compressions and to limit um, yourselves to one window per pulse check. There are a lot of different ultrasound protocols that have been proposed. Um, some of them are listed here. Again, the fear field protocol is still the most familiar to me. And I think many, um, you can tell me if you're using something different, but um, and that is what we teach. Um, but few of these have really been tested heavily in clinical practice. Um, but regardless, they all share some very common goals that we should always remember, which are that first and foremost, the most important um, uh, the most important thing that we achieve is high quality CPR. Um, and that using ultrasound can be helpful for both assessing the presence of spontaneous cardiac motion. So again, who has true versus pseudo PEA, um, assessing and evaluating for those reversible etiologies of arrest. So going through the H's and T's um, and minimizing those no flow intervals. So here was one um, suggested protocol done in a series of patients um, and again, we can see that the first branch point is really to assess is cardiac motion present before then ruling out big pathologies like effusion causing tamponade, acute RV or LV dysfunction, and um, acute hypovolemia. Um, but this was a very small series, just kind of, um, I think, um, looking at five inpatients, they did find that most of the images were adequate for interpretation and the average time from exam to image interpretation was just under eight minutes. Um, this was the cause protocol and it's pretty similar. If you look at the branch points, I just wanna highlight that, you know, after assessing for acute cardiac pathology, so cardiac exam that rules out tamponade, hypovolemia, or you know, a dilated RV suggested of massive PE, they also added a pleural scan to rule out um, pneumothorax as an ideology. So here is both cardiac and lung exam 
be incorporated into this protocol. The Sesame Protocol was developed by Dr. Lichtenstein, who um, has done a lot of work in pleural scanning and lung-based POCUS. Um, and what it did was it added to the pleural scan also a vascular exam component. So looking for presence of DVTs in the um, major lower extremity vessels before then moving to uh, the cardiac views, including the subcostal window, looking at the IVC um, and four chamber view, as well as then ruling out those similar pathologies of um, tamponade or acute RVLV dysfunction hypovolemia. Um, and then I said we would get back to the feel protocol, which is what I'm going to show you a little more on and probably spend the remainder of this time just reviewing. Um, so this developed um, and was published in a series of about 200 ED patients presenting with either um, arrest or shock. Most of these patients did receive what they called the field exam, so this protocol, by ED physicians who were trained. Um, and you can see, you know, almost 100% of these images um, were considered diagnostic quality. And that of these patients, again, as we mentioned, you know, many of them presented in asystole and PEA, but that when ultrasound was used, the findings of these echo exams altered management in the vast majority of cases. And you can see what altered management looked like. Um, usually it was some kind of change in therapy, but sometimes it um, referred to a change in disposition or management with hospital choice, um, et cetera. And so the fear or field protocol can be split into many phases. And we will go through these a couple of times with illustrations. Um, but what it does suggest is when you are performing ultrasound to start with a subcostal view, we know that both for um, people who are learning ultrasound and people who are obtaining images of the heart during arrest, subcostal view has the highest success rate. And some people say, um, you know, unless there is a barrier to a subcostal view, it's really the only view that is necessary. Um, but to start with a subcostal view, look for spontaneous cardiac motion before then moving on to the qualitative assessment of those H's and T's. Um, but of course, if in VF or VT to not delay defibrillation, um, and if if not, so if in PEA or asystole, that the first fear or ultrasound exam should happen after the first um, two minutes or cycles of CPR. So, you know, I think realistically, especially for us in the ICUs, I mean, it's you know, we don't always have ultrasound in these rooms with these patients. So it would be very unlikely to have a probe on the chest um, as soon as CPR is commencing. But the recommendation is to wait until the first cycle of CPR is um, completed before performing your first ultrasound exam. Um, so here we just sort of reinforce that. And then when you're performing the exam to perform it during the pulse rhythm check. And as we mentioned, to try to limit that to that gold standard of less than 10 seconds. And you can repeat the fear exam as many times as necessary as the code is still ongoing. This is an updated illustration that just shows, you know, where your general compression zone is. You probably have some sole pads on as well. Um, and where there are available real estate on the torso for ultrasound examination. So again, after the first two minutes of CPR, we see the first exam being performed. And I think what I like about this is, is record the exam um, before assessing, you know, those cardiac structures. And you can see that as the code goes on, you may incorporate other views during those no flow intervals. So I was just going to break it down a little bit further by phase, and then we will put it all together in a couple of videos here. Um, so the first phase of really using ultrasound in parallel to CPR is preparing the ultrasound as CPR is ongoing. So this means, you know, the first cycle of CPR is ongoing, a uh, sonographer and ultrasound is being called to the bedside, and the sonographer who's been assigned should announce to the team that they are preparing the ultrasound and then prepare tests or remove any barriers to image acquisition. In our case, this often means uncovering the patient, um, taking down dressings that might be in the way of examination, et cetera. The execution of the echocardiogram should include placing the probe in the subcostal area even before um, the pulse rhythm check has started. So as CPR is still ongoing, you know, out of the way of the compressors, you can start placing the probe in the subcostal region um, and then when the code team leader or the timekeeper announces the upcoming pulse rhythm check being ready to perform the subcostal exam and to um, record, 
uh, your loop as the no flow interval proceeds. And then during this time, we always recommend, this is like part of the biggest part of training is that someone on the team, usually the co-team leader, should then count down 10 seconds so that everybody knows when the exam needs to be truncated and when we need to be back on the chest. And so then the next phase, of course, is resumption of CPR, announcing continuing CPR, or switching compressors, if that's indicated, um, as the sonographer can then go and review the recorded image. Um, so there's a lot of different ways we can report findings, um, but I am a big proponent of just simple closed loop dialogue. So I always tell our residents and fellows, like, we don't have to be super articulate. We just want to know a couple things really quickly. For instance, was it a good or bad quality image? Do we see the heart moving or not moving? And can we assess anything qualitatively outside of that? For instance, maybe we saw a pericardial effusion, but we're not sure if there really is chamber compression or that alone is the cause of arrest. Um, and if you'd have a bad quality image or you really can't conclude anything or there is no significant finding to be reported, to say that as well. One of the harms I think we can do is trying to make a diagnosis out of a bad quality image. Okay. Oh, sorry. So I'm going to show you the video now. This was a sim. There's a couple sims that I have to show you that just kind of tie these things together. The first is um, a sim we did, and I apologize for a little bit of the grainy footage, but it is a nice, like, direct over the mannequin shot of um, how these elements. Okay. Okay. We're getting ready to our second minute. Um, in 10. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Stop CPR, uh, Sonal. Check the pulse. Seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Start CPR. Check the head. So we have a rhythm, no pulse. So we are in TDNR. Um, so it may seem silly, but I think I always try to highlight that, you know, some of the most important components of this are to count down. So someone should just be counting out loud as the probe is on the chest and no CPR is happening. Um, and then even a countdown leading up to that can be helpful too. So everybody's ready to go once the compressions um, are paused. Um, here's an, another video that's also um, a sim, but it's just a little more staged, but I think helps show those elements coming together again as well. Um, this is from my group Sir, can you hear me? Vermont. Let Space is let the go for I can feel a grab of this many times around. It's got a neurosciences complex rhythm. Start chest compressions, Will. Definitely. Caitlin, can you grab an AED and a code cart and call for help? And uh, Paige, will you assist with the airway? Looks like we're in uh, the PEA algorithm. So, Mandy, can you grab an um, echo? Yeah, let's give a milligram of epi IV. What cycle is this? This is the fifth cycle. Okay. We'll start with the echo. Milligram of epi then. Thank you. So in 10 seconds, we're going to do a rhythm and a pulse check, and along with that, a feel exam. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, Four, three, two, one, ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. We'll resume chest compressions. There are no pulses. Okay, looks like the there's no pericardial effusion. The RP's functioning well, but he's grossly underfilled. He's hypovolemic. Caitlin, can you get a bag of normal saline and another milligram of epi? Sure. Okay. Um, so I hope that kind of illustrates how all of those um, components and phases come together. Um, and I think I was just going to end this talk with a couple of real cases that um, we saw in which POCUS helped to acutely manage the patient. So the first was a 70 year old man who was month, one month post-op from a cab that was unfortunately complicated by HIT. Um, you know, this patient population sees a lot of heparin, so um, we see it not uncommonly. And he did have an acute thrombotic complication in his lower extremity. So he was representing to the OR for amputation. Um, but being on Coumadin, he presented with an INR of seven and not wanting to wait to go to the OR, of course, 
Um, he was rapidly reversed to units of FFP, after which he became acutely hypoxemic and hypotensive. Um, so you probably have a pretty high sort of pretest um, kind of probability for what the diagnosis is in your mind, but this was a subcostal view we found we first saw. Um, you know, it's not as high resolution of an image as some of the nicer pictures that I've showed you, but you can see, I hope, that um, the LV uh, systolic function is fairly reduced and perhaps even looking a little bit dilated. Um, here was a four chamber view. It's a little more obvious here that LV was just very reduced EF. Um, I don't have actually a plural or a lung scan to show you, but it would have been just full of B lines. Um, so this was a patient who um, had probably some reduction in their um, cardiac function post-op, um, even despite revascularization, and then just could not tolerate that massive um, volume load um, during reversal of their um, Coumadin therapy and went to flash pulmonary edema with acute um, cardiomyopathy encoded. So he was resuscitated with some inotrope therapy. Um, obviously, a surgery was delayed as um, his volume management was optimized, um, but then he did survive and make it through his surgery um, and go home. This was another case. This was a 54-year-old woman with severe OSA undergoing an elective cardiac cath, um, but following administration of sedation, she became acutely hypoxemic and arrests. Um, I wish I could say I'm not called to the cath lab that often for situations like this, but unfortunately they, they do come up every now and then just because these patients do have so many comorbidities. Um, this was the first image during that arrest scenario. And while we see that there are probably some cardiac structures that could be looked at here, um, maybe something of a four or five chamber view, um, the clip is really short and you really just can't make any assumptions or conclusions based on this. So I would just say this is not a good quality image and we need to repeat at the next available window. Um, at which we got a parasternal view, which looks something like this. Um, it's a little bit hard to see because this LV is very small and this whole territory to the left of that is the RV, which is extremely dilated um, and not um, pumping very effectively. I think we have one more view here. So here is a four chamber view. We can see a little bit better. That's really small looking LV, which we can see is probably related to this big dilated RV, not really translating um, cardiac output to the left side very effectively. So here was someone who maybe had, you know, chronic lung disease and pulmonary vascular resistance did not tolerate, you know, probably a period of hypoventilation during her sedation um, and went into a QRV failure as a result, um, uh, leading to an arrest scenario actually. So again, she did respond and regain ROSC after initial resuscitation. So in summary, um, you know, I hope that you already, but at least through this have appreciated that echocardiography is a powerful tool for looking at those reversible causes for arrest um, and that identifying cardiac standstill alone um, can be very helpful and predictive. Um, and that when applied in an ALS compliant protocol using POCUS or focus echocardiography, um, can be performed without compromise the high quality CPR, but this really does require um, training of providers who are going to be utilizing um, these tools. So um, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about. I love teaching residents and fellows and using ultrasound and arrest. I almost never don't use an ultrasound in an arrest scenario. Um, and so my contact is here if anyone has any further questions, but of course I'm happy to take them now too.